안녕하세요, Cloud입니다. Hey guys, Cloud here. Uh, today I have a very special guest, Becky. Um, you know her from her Twitter. I'm sure everybody listening does know who she is. Uh, Kapalang is her uh, handle on Twitter. I'll leave a link to her Twitter as well uh, below in case you're not sure who this is. Um, I had an interview with her where we kind of just went through you know, her language learning journey. Um, she started learning before there was really any internet and how that kind of changed throughout time with the development of internet, with having so many resources uh, you know, at your disposal. Um, and we went through basically her different phases as everybody has, phases of learning different languages, um, not knowing exactly what you want to learn, or maybe you do know what you want to learn, um, setting goals and whatnot. Um, so we kind of went through basically her her whole journey um, and we learned a few things along the way. Um, I learned a lot for sure. And uh, she, I think she also may have uh, realized a couple things. So hopefully you guys will enjoy as well. All right, we're on. Uh, so um, if you could introduce yourself real quick for people. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Becky. Um, and I think most of you will know me from my Twitter, uh, Kappa Lang. I am Ish. I'm from London, but I'm currently living in Kyoto, Japan. Um, I've been a language learner for most of my life, and I mainly study Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin, but I have gone through a, a huge dabbling journey throughout uh, my, my short life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking forward to hearing about it. Um, so yeah, I guess we can get right into it. Uh, let's just start from the beginning. How did it start? There are so many different hobbies that you could have gotten into. Why, why language learning? Um, it's, it's quite different to a lot of people, actually. Um, so I've always had this kind of, um, uh, how, how to explain it, like uh, a kind of consciousness of the other. So there's always, I've always been aware that there are, there are places outside of not just you know our places in the UK but other countries so um, my grandmother is actually from Turkey and she immigrated to the UK when she was 16 she's she's lived here pretty much most of her life now and then as a young kid obviously she, she had an accent and she, she would mm -hmm. we'd have family visit um, and even she'd have you know, Turkish things in her house and that so since I was born, I was aware that you know she's not from this country in this area that I am growing up in, but she's from somewhere else. And uh, I would hear Turkish, but sadly, I don't speak Turkish. Um, mm -hmm. I wish you taught me, but I don't. Um, and my grandfather, so her husband, uh, he's British, but he lived in India for 16 years or 18 years. Oh, um, wow. And he also has her an accent. And, you know, that is, as, as a kid, you know, you don't, it's the first thing you hear is like, oh, they don't sound like mom and dad. They, mm -hmm. they sound a little bit different. So he had an Indian accent, even though he was white British. Um, and I was just like, oh, why? Why? And he, oh, he lived in India for um, 18 years. So I was like, oh, okay, where's India? And, you know, where's Turkey? And, you know, that really, really sparked my interest from a young age. And um, fortunately, I never got to visit and I haven't actually visited Turkey um, I think we still have family, maybe. I'm not sure if they'll move back to the UK from India, but um, unfortunately, I never got to visit. Uh, we'd always have um, atlases in our house, and um, I would use the atlases as kind of a, a imaginative journey around the world. So I would look at different mm. countries and where the cities are. And I think for a lot of atlases for kids, they have um, just the things that are really... Um, really well known, really famous in, you know, in the country. So uh, Turkey, there would be you know, Turkish tea or you know, Turkish carpets or something. And for China, there'd be a picture of a panda and, um, and the food and uh, the Amazon, you know, there'd be these wonderful animals and things. So um, I, uh, the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, obviously, but um, <laughs> This just really intrigued me, like you know, this, this, uh, the, the rest of the world that we live in, and so I was always very, very curious. So that kind of kind of implanted a, a curiosity in me when I was young. Um, but I didn't start learning languages 
Um, so I did. It, I only. I was brought up speaking English only. Uh, my dad didn't learn Turkish from his his mother. My mom is just. Uh, she's uh, British. So we just. I just. Brought, I was brought up learning and speaking English. But um, my mom, she got me a like a vocabulary, like a picture vocabulary book. You know what you get for kids and this. A picture of an animal and the name in French, and it was quite, it was quite, um, had a lot of information in it. So she got me this one in French because she kept telling me at some point, you're going to learn French in school. And you know, she'd like me to do well in school and give me a head start since I was so curious about all these different uh, countries and cultures. Um, so I try and read it, but we didn't have any audio or anything. And French isn't the best language to learn without audio, <laughs> yeah. especially when you're reading it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it and I, I did this really weird thing when I was a kid I, I, obviously this is so wrong but I thought that there was a code so what a, a letter in English would be it would be this in French as if everything's revolved around English so I was trying to decode French from English so if like if a B was like if there was a B in English what would that correspond to in French and it was just this it's so wrong, but I think it was a kind of interesting way of thinking about things. So yeah, I would read it um, and try to understand what's going on. Obviously, it was, it's wrong, but um, it kept me occupied. Um, this began my dabbling journey. So it would always, it would always be with books. Um, so I got like a, a Turkish phrase book. So I was like, I want to learn Turkish. It's a part of my identity. You know, it's my mm -hmm. heritage. Um, I've never visited, but I'd like to learn Turkish. And I got a little phrase book. Because Turkey is quite a, um, a tourist destination for British people. So, you know, quite a lot there. But me, I must have been about eight. Most of the things you find in these kind of phrase books for tourists don't be, resonate with an eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for it. I tried to learn words like, you know, knife and fork and things that were around me. But... I still have the book, but you know most of it didn't. I um, I'd never used a credit card. I was eight, so <laughs> um, <laughs> I was just like, "What? What is this?" So, um, and I didn't last for very long. Um, but I was still like, looking at through the words and trying to figure out the grammar. I was like, "Why does the verb come here?" And you know, why does it? Why does it? Why is it spelled like that? So I didn't have any audio. Um, my nan would try and help me, but she was never trained in teaching anybody Turkish. So it, it, I, I got like maybe one or two words out of her, but she got too excited. Um, and yeah, I just started collecting language books. And um, I think a lot of people are familiar with Teach Yourself. Um, and it's a British publisher. It's British, yeah. Um, they, they do have a lot of books widely available in a lot of areas. So um, I think also not just my, my family, but where I was brought up in, uh, in London, in East London, there, there's a, a huge uh, population of West Africans, uh, Indians, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, like that area. So, it's, yeah, I've you know, heard. I'd, I'd see. The, hmm. I was always like, I was always experiencing different cultures and different languages. Um, and now I just started buying books. I, you know, I bought books you know, Japanese again with no audio. So I had this strange accent, British accent when I was reading things and bought the kanji book and I got one in Chinese um, and then I got like picture books with you know word the picture and the, the word like vocabulary books um, and I was just kind of enjoying just reading through them but I I think that I started really dabbling once I got the internet so this was like pre-internet my uh, we got the internet about 2005 so I think my parents decided not to trial with um dial up internet we waited for uh, broadband and once we got the internet that was it i was looking at um sort of you know forums and chat rooms for languages um i got really into art and through art i started to meet people from other countries online i was like i was like what 12 <laughs> um i was just you know, chatting to people from all over the world um and then I decided to learn Finnish. Finnish? <laughs> Finnish. Uh, I was in, at the time, uh, I was in secondary school, so it's like middle school. 
Um, and we, we, learn, we learn French and I think by the third year, so our secondary school is five years and then we have two years for sixth form or college, which is like high school. Um, so by the third year of secondary school, you know, we can choose German. Um, but by that time I was learning Finnish because my first online friend was from Finland. Oh, we met through okay. a digital art community. So um, I'd already Japanese and you know the words don't look anything like English and kind of compared it to French so Finnish wasn't I mean I heard it's very difficult and then obviously it's not spoken anywhere else apart from Finland and it's not really taught in the UK so I found obviously it was a bit of a strange choice but yeah I started learning Finnish um, about age 12 13 and um, I, I remember using the teach yourself and at the time, then I had the internet as well, so I had access to audio. And I used the uh, website Unilang. It's still around. It's an old, like a forum. Um, it's kind of stuck in the early noughties. So it's a very like, 2005, 2007 feel to it. Um, and they still have some um, resources for very obscure and um, minority languages. Um, I started using that for Finnish, for audio. Uh, I used their resources on there. And then suddenly I decided to learn Japanese. You know. I, oh, that was when I decided on learning a language uh, properly. So I was about 15 or something. I, I got to like an intermediate-ish level in Finnish from reading and chatting. I, I never spoke Finnish. I, I had some music that my friend introduced me to um I didn't get very far and I think by like 15 or something I was like, I want to go back to Japanese I have this book I like the sound of Japanese I wasn't really interested in anime or manga at the time um I mean, we don't have as much anime on on uh, well at the time on UK TV channels um the um I mean everyone know, knows Pokemon but we would have like just the American dub. We wouldn't have anything that was subbed. I, mean, mm. I never got to hear Japanese, but I liked the way it was written in Romaji on the page, and I liked the writing system when you know, I looked at the writing, the book for the writing and stuff, and I was really drawn to it. Um, that was, yeah, around about 15, I started learning Japanese, and I spent hours, hours online, and I, I was kind of reminiscing about it yesterday when I would sit on this like, language chat room called Shared Talk, by Rosetta Stone. Uh, it closed in 2015. Um, I would spend hours on there and I, I really attribute all that time I spent chatting to people um, to a lot of my Japanese uh, progress at that time. And I stuck with Japanese for a few years and then I, I kind of encountered Korean. So, um, in the UK, we don't really have a, a high uh, Korean population, a uh, large Korean population is um, mainly in kind of the South London areas. But um, when I was learning Japanese, a, a lot of Koreans um, on the, these forums were very good at Japanese and they would often answer my questions about learning materials and things. So I started getting really interested in you know, their country and I was like, where is this country? And my dad told me it was in Croatia, it was Croatia in Europe. Uh, he, did, oh, wow. he, did ta he did taekwondo, a taekwondo, and uh, as a kid, and I was like, "Oh, where's taekwondo from?" And he was like, "Oh, it's from Croatia." <laughs> <laughs> I spent all these years thinking Korea was in Europe, um, but eventually, with the armed with the internet, I found out that she's right next to Japan, which was really interesting for me. I was so drawn to um, Asia in particular. Um, and around about that time, I think K-pop started becoming more popular in these kind of niche groups of, of uh, people online and uh, in some of my friendship groups as well. And that's when I, I think around about 17, I was really interested in Korea. But I, I kind of stayed studying those two languages. Um, I was really interested in Cantonese as well. A little bit, and, and, I have a bit of a rebellious streak, so I was like, I don't really want to learn the mainstream language, I want to learn the one that's not so oh. mainstream, so I didn't go for Mandarin. 
Um, and I had a lot of friends who spoke Cantonese as well because obviously Hong Kong and the UK have a, a, a long history, mm-hmm. longish history. So I was really interested in Cantonese for a while, but it didn't really take off. But I think just growing up as a very curious person, I, I was dabbling a lot in you know, finding out about you know their writing system, what they sound like. Um, Particularly when I, I go to look on Wikipedia, I always go to like the uh, syntax page, like what does it look like in syntax, and then I'll check the phonology and see if it has any interesting sounds. Um, I find it really interesting. I, I, I really enjoy trying to pronounce different words in different languages. It's just kind of, it's very fun. It's a kind of, mm-hmm. um, kind of ex- exploratory and kind of, um, what's the word? Just a, it was a bit of a journey really to kind of try these things out. Um, Language learning in general is, is a kind of a journey for me as well, from you know knowing nothing to being being able to understand. But um, yeah, I just started dabbling in all kinds of things and you know being curious, finding out you know how they're written, and, you know what the vocabulary looks like, um, how complex is it, how many different things are required to you know express a certain idea. And I think I've always been like that now, even though I mean. I feel like the language learning community has, uh, you know, people who are st- like stuck on one language, not stuck, but you know, they, they stick to their one language. It's it's like their bay, you know, you, you stay, you love this language, it's going to be the only language you ever learn and you want to live there or something. And then there are other people who are dabbling um, and they just, they have maybe a few main languages, but then they, they have a, a very extensive knowledge of many other languages. Then maybe, and then you've got like the really hardcore polyglots who can just um, mm. <laughs> manage and juggle all these different languages and I have no idea how they do it. So I'm kind of like, you know, wandering between the dabbler and the kind of the, um, what's it, like the dedicated language of the very, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a word, <laughs> I can't think of it, but yeah, the dedicated language learner. So yeah, I've always, uh, I really, really enjoyed it throughout my life. And I always found it a little bit sad, but I, people around me didn't really enjoy languages as much as I did. Oh. Um, yeah, I did make friends in London through the internet and you know, they would be interested in um, Japanese culture, Korean culture, and we, we're still friends now. Um, I just I can't see them now because of the co- Corona yeah. situation. But um, then I think, it's also the, not just the culture, but also languages themselves. And I've really found that um, the community, for example, on Twitter and websites like that, just it, it's really nice to be able to just geek over with these kinds of languages and things. So yeah, I just, I'm the kind of person that will just put on like, you know, this is an Asian languages and then just listen through someone reading, I don't know, like the, the Lord's Prayer or something in several different languages. Mm. And like, oh, this is so cool. Um, there's always a Lord's Prayer in his <laughs> in his languages, um, but I just sit and listen like it's music. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, languages are great. Do you still dabble in other languages, or are you kind of mainly focused now on those three, like Japanese, Korean, and uh, Mandarin? Um, I, from time to time, I will I will dabble just a bit as a palate cleanser. Uh, because I still have this kind of curiosity and the desire to like, learn about other languages, um, but I do try to stick to the main ones because um, the, the the progress I made in Japanese and I was just focusing on Japanese is kind of unforgettable. And um, I I really did learn a lot of Japanese. I think within the two years I was at maybe like JLPT N two level because I was obsessed. Like I spent wow. hours online. Um, I was on. I, chatting to people I would never I, would, I was very scared to talk to people with voice and my parents were always in the house but I was online chatting a lot I was buying books and um, I, I made a huge amount of progress in those two years and then um, you know life happens you go to university and you've got other things to do with um, yeah I try to stick to the main languages so I'm trying now I live in Japan it's a bit easier to maintain Japanese although mm-hmm. with the coronavirus situation I don't really see anybody anywhere. like I just you know Oh. Maybe talk to the staff in the convenience stores or whatever. Um, but I don't really see anyone now. Um, we're trying to focus on Korean because it's 
it's not been as consistent as I'd like it to be and I'm kind of frustrated at how little progress I'm making. So yeah, I'm trying to stay in the this kind of dedicated to one language group. But still I wonder over to the dabbling. Uh, particularly with Duolingo, I think Duolingo is like the worst for um, temptation because they're all there uh -huh. for free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I've, I've got every single language on there. <laughs> oh, wow. Even languages I thought I wouldn't even learn, like German. I was like, oh, I wonder, what's the German like? Can I understand it as an English speaker? Oh, I do a bit of German in school. And like, oh, I'll just do a bit of German for about half an hour. And I'm like, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would, uh, can't speak Spanish, but I would change it to Spanish and go, oh, I wonder if I could learn Guarani in Spanish at the same time. And I was like, wait, why am I here? <laughs> go back. <laughs> That's quite funny. Yes, yeah. It's also a little bit liberating. I mean, you said that you had started learning when there wasn't really an internet. You had to buy books, and it was a long, tedious process, and now it's at your fingertips. So it might as well, you know, take advantage of it. Exactly, yeah. Um, I Now I do wonder. Um, I tried to think back of what, what it was like when I was sat at my computer. I was in hours, and now I'm on my smartphone for hours and hours. I wonder if it's how different it is and um, it's just much it's much easier it is definitely liberating to um, to be able to you know look up on YouTube and feel oh I want to listen to something in Korean I really want to listen about tea or something let's see if I can you know look up tea and you know how to make tea or something in Korean and it's there and it's just, it's amazing to this change and um, but at the same time I feel like even though it's liberating it's also very overwhelming Mm -hmm. There's so much, and I, I find that, that is a big problem I have right now. So it's not just books, there's podcasts, there's um, websites that teach you know, that language, or um, apps, or there's just so much. You now I, I feel like a little bit lost. All yeah. of these, yeah, resources. Yeah, back then you would just buy a book that was the only one available in the library. And you wouldn't have to worry mm -hmm. much about it, whether it was good or not. Yeah, you would just deal with it. So yeah. sometimes I, I, when particularly when listening to a lot of polyglots who are a lot older and saying, you know, we had this book and we just had to have a CD player or CD player, tape player, uh, cassette uh, player, and we would just sit there and I was like, well, you know, that is it gives a lot of um, structure and it's, it's limiting, but also. Like reassuring, and now it's just there's just so much going on, and being as as curious as I am, I just want to like try everything. And I think that has has been something that has put me back a little bit when learning Korean because Korean is so many things. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when talk to me in Korean started, um, and now you know there's just so many different things that you can use for Korean, and uh, it's really overwhelming. You know? Yeah, it really is. Even. <clears throat> On, just on Twitter, if you ask someone, hey, where can I learn Korean? You'd find like people just linking threads of just resources on resources. Yeah, it just, it just like an ocean, you just have to, you know, you don't, there's really no way to navigate for it now like with the internet and stuff. So I re, uh, now I just kind of looking, go for a bit of a period of introspection now to you know, find out what, what really works for me and just go with the flow as well especially with this kind of weird corona situation we're in um it's just to do what do i want then try it out if it doesn't work don't do it again and still dabble mm -hmm. probably in turkish i feel like as a part of my identity i can never really let go of so i always have turkish as my palate cleanser that's cool um what was the point so you said at around 15 you really started going serious um like hardcore into Japanese and you'd spend like hours and hours what mm. what led to that I mean I know you were studying Finnish and then you kind of switched over to Japanese and that's when it started but was there some sort of moment where it was like okay I really love the way it sounds I'm going to learn this or what 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 triggered that sort of change I'm not exactly sure um I I had a I had a think about this actually um and I think because I was in the art community, like digital art, I used DeviantArt um, to post some of my, my drawings and things. And I noticed a lot of people I followed did have a kind of anime style to some of their characters. 
Mm-hmm. And when I would, oh, I, I would just like look at their art and I said, oh, this is kind of Japanese inspired in a way, like the way they drew faces or you know eyes mm-hmm. or you know, there is a, a, a distinctive style. I was like, okay. And then I, I looked back to my books and I was like, oh, Japanese. I remember Japanese. I mean, mm-hmm. that might have been a trigger. But then at the same time, I think I've always enjoyed Japanese and I've always enjoyed a challenge. Um, I don't think there's any there's such thing as a, a kind of difficult language in, in terms of like, it's so difficult, it's impossible. It's different. Mm-hmm. And I always kept it as some, that was how I kind of got over the initial shock of, you know, verbs going at the end and, um, and you know, changing the verbs and uh, you know, agglutination and things. That's kind of, I just kept telling myself it's different. I really like that the challenge and mental challenge that came with it. I, I really wonder what, what it was. It might have been people I've spoken to online. Um, it might have been something that it triggered that kind of um, dormant curiosity towards Japanese. Um, my, my dad was always into uh, martial arts films and Asian culture. He did taekwondo and he, he had this like katana in the house. I mean, we're from oh, cool. in London. You never know if someone's going to break in. You need a sword. <laughs> 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 we all had, a, had something. So I had the, I think I had the katana and he had the chair leg. And so I was like, protected by this sword. <laughs> um, so it, it, something also triggered it. And I was like, I want to be fluent in this language. And I think there was a novelty aspect to it that no one around me was Japanese, no one spoke Japanese, no one really knew about the country. I really, I was kind of infatuated with the traditional culture, which though obviously the UK does have its own traditional culture. It was, it's, it's normal to any, you know, when you look around you're like, oh, this is normal. Afternoon tea, I mean, that's what posh people do, but it's still normal. Or this mm-hmm. kind of architecture is always around me. Like, oh, this is amazing, but it's it's normal. And I was always, kind of hungry for something that wasn't normal and yeah i i went for it and when you're at that age you have so much time mm-hmm. and i i just went for it and yeah I, I got quite fluent in a very short amount of time but it's always fluctuated with like what's my interest have been i was doing yeah do you still happen to have that katana i think we do still have it um, it's not sharpened, and I don't know mm-hmm. if it's really real. It might just, I think it was a, a, a replica, but we do have it. Um, I also have a very, it was a very beautiful wooden one with it. It was, it, it's just a, a, decor, a decorative, um, sana, but yeah, I had a beautiful wooden one. Yeah, we just, we were really obsessed with, well, my dad was really obsessed with the Asian culture. And my middle name is actually Lee, because my dad is a fan of Bruce Lee. So my, oh. my, my middle name, um, yeah, is Lee. So people are like, are you Korean or Chinese? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've joined the Lee, the Lee clans in, in China and um, Vietnam and Korea now. So. Yeah, when I saw um, your handle, I just assumed that, you know, E Becky, in, when you wrote it in Korean, yeah. I just assumed that E was like, you know, people give themselves like last names. I didn't realize... No, it's mm. it's your real name. That's so cool. Actually, yeah, it's my real name. It's my middle name. So um, I always said this as a, as a joke to my friends. I was like, if I were to marry a Korean with the surname Lee, my name would become Rebecca Lee Lee. <laughs> 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 uh, that's funny to think about. It's funny. Unfortunately, I'm in academia, so I can't do that. But um, it, it's, it's just so funny. I, I really love my middle name. I really thank my dad for that. It's a great conversation starter. Um, yeah, so we, there was always this kind of cultural interest and also the kind of linguistic, um, linguistic um, kind of, I, I kind of think of it as a bit like, I, I, I liked maths when I was in school, but like when you go, when you try a, a calculation, you get to the end and you understand it and you go through this process. And I feel like language learning is probably not quite the same, but for me, I really like the process of not knowing anything at the beginning and learning and acquiring and then at the end you could understand it like i remember back when i was learning japanese and i would use the, the 101 you know like the japanese pod mm-hmm. 101 yeah those guys um i remember listening to their halloween 
stories collection and I can understand a word of it. It just melted together and it just a blur of sounds. And now I can practically passively listen and understand Japanese on pretty much anything now. I think there's very few things that I can't really understand unless they're like not in my area of like expertise. Uh, mm-hmm. Some tried to explain the stock market to me in Japanese. It wouldn't make a difference what language it was in. I would have no idea what it was about. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just amazing looking back at that. And that's what's something that really kept me going. The kind of mental arithmetic, the mental gymnastics you do to learn languages and you get to that moment of understanding. Yeah. Worth it. Uh, yeah. Are you doing your PhD in linguistics? I, I didn't ask. What is your... My PhD is a bit of a weird um, area, actually. So I, I initially did my gra- undergraduate in Japanese studies. I really wanted to go to Japan. And I, it's very difficult for um, the UK to go abroad if it's not Europe. When we were in the EU, I'm so sad. But when we were in the EU, you could go to any EU country and to do part of your degree abroad. But um, if you wanted to go somewhere like Japan, China, you'd have to do the language as a subject. So I'd never been, and I went for my first time in my third year. I really wanted to go to Japan, so I did Japanese studies at university. But then I wanted to do something, quote unquote, useful. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I really cared about, and I'd always cared about languages. So I did my master's in Japan at Kyoto University, uh, where I am now, in foreign language education. So it's a bit like applied linguistics oh, for two okay. years. Uh, most of the classes were on like curriculum design. I mean, generally, uh, the education wasn't what I was expecting, actually. Um, but this is a topic for like, going forever. But yeah, so I think most of the classes were on like curriculum design and learning and second language acquisition. Um, mostly it was just like read this book and do a presentation on this chapter. Um, so I did a lot of reading. Now, what I was really, really interested in was like the mental processes people go through when they're learning languages. So it's not necessarily that the aspects, you know, um, like order of uh, morphological acquisition, you know, or past tense goes before whatever or the um, determiners go before whatever. Not so much the kind of pure linguistic elements to it or how to teach difficult sounds, particularly for Japanese students learning English sounds that don't exist in Japanese. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't so much that, but it was more like the learning process, like the cognitive processes that happen. So I moved to psychology. Now I'm in uh, a department for educational cognitive psychology. And they, the other labs, well, the, my lab as well, focus on like learning strategies and king memory, um, a lot of brain stuff as well, um, and how this applies to education. So I now look at the same language learning process but from a psychological perspective and a cognitive perspective has that changed your sort of understanding of how languages or how to approach languages or is it more like this is kind of what happens on the back end but in terms of studying it's a little different i'm I'm not too sure so it's it's made me more aware about you know certain things that would be more effective when learning languages and also to be more understanding of myself as well. So my research area is in anxiety and I'm actually quite an anxious and shy person. So I, I think a lot of what people have said is anyone studying psychology probably has a personal reason for it. Uh, <laughs> I've never heard that big, uh, I am guilty of that. So I'm quite an anxious person and I look at anxiety and speaking and what it does to our minds and our brains. Um, and how it can affect when we while we're speaking what what it does to us basically. Um, I, I've become a lot more kind to myself, a lot more kind to other people, and you know I say you know, this is what happens. It, it happens, oh. and you know this is what you can do about it. Um, and then the psychological perspective has given me a lot more kind of humanist perspective on my own language learning and people's language learning, and I really apply it to when I teach English um, as a part-time un, un, uh, university lecturer um, and I try to combine not just the cognitive part the thinking part the studying part but also the affective like the the emotions that come with it as well and how that helps people study and as well as you know things like 
Um, if you're learning vocabulary, don't write the word a hundred times on the same page. Like, go read a book. And there is uh, there is research for this and why you know why writing a word a hundred times on the same page isn't going to help you very much. Um, things like that, just kind of snippets of information. They're feeling like, oh, okay, so this is better. Go read a book, or you know, go watch something on YouTube. Um, and it really, I do find myself um, when I was learning Japanese. Actually, I think all Japanese all the time was a, a thing, and I, I did, I didn't really follow it. I like the philosophy uh, uh, behind it. I never really mm -hmm. followed it. And same with like immersion approaches. Now I, I see the the benefit of them from a kind of where, where I'm researching and that. Um, yeah, it's just kind of given me a different kind of view on things that are happening and I hope that one day some of my research will be useful. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but we've gone full circle. You started off as a 12 year old chatting um, on these like Skype and forums and like you were too anxious to kind of speak, use voice chat. And now you're actually learning about that sort of anxiety in, in uh, speaking and whatnot. So uh, we've definitely come full circle. It's very interesting how like years later, you know, things still connect. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I wonder if there's maybe that, yeah, I'm guilty of choosing psychology to solve my own problems. <laughs> I'm still quite anxious, actually. Um, I have I, now with, you know, apps and things are in, in progressing and um, new social media is coming um, coming out and you know clubhouse is a new thing that everyone's obsessed with right now and it's a great opportunity to learn how to speak but I'm also really nervous and I have actually closed rooms people have entered them because I'm so I'm so nervous <laughs> oh. eventually I will, I will stop doing this um, but yeah I mean like, language learning is it's such a multifaceted um, complex and um, fascinating thing that there's always an area for everybody to enjoy yeah to like look at yeah. so one last question do you have a language where you're just much more comfortable speaking in than not not in terms of like fluency but in terms of just like you can speak without worry i don't know if i'm making too much sense um I, yeah um so other than english um Yes, Japanese, maybe. I don't have a lot of languages I can choose from because, I don't know, um, my French is so bad. I don't even say I speak French anymore. It's just kind of like English with a bad accent. <laughs> uh, I can't speak French. Isn't that French? Uh, <laughs> I, I can't speak French. So other than, I mean, mm, the way I've learned, I learned Korean a little bit later. And Japanese I think I've got used to just kind of bullshitting my way through any situation but then mm -hmm. I as I I wrote my Twitter I, I my listening is actually really bad so I keep saying yes to everything and I've actually got into trouble before saying oh, oh yeah no. yeah and then <laughs> I've been in Korean they're like okay come along I'm like what what did I just agree to <laughs> um I think I'm quite I'm a lot maybe a lot less anxious in Korean I'm not sure but Japanese maybe because I do have the you know, I have listening abilities, I can understand what people are saying, and I've learned it for a lot longer. Um, but actually, what's really interesting is the higher level you get, the more anxious you get for some people. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, you start noticing your own mistakes, and you start seeing yourself not being able to think of a word. Um, so actually, the anxiety does go up to the advanced level in some cases. Um, yeah, I think I'm just anxious in all the languages. <laughs> Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah, because I noticed, at least for myself, uh, I just started Japanese recently, and I'll spend like 30 seconds thinking of the word because I know it, and I don't, re I don't really, like care too much that I can't think of the word. But in Korean, because I'm a little more advanced, if I spend more than two seconds, I'm like, all right, just skip it. Just like explain the word or just change mm -hmm. the way I'm going to say the sentence. or It's just a little bit of pressure, I guess. So speak, learning a new yeah. language just feels a little liberating. Yeah, and particularly um, languages like the Mandarin and well, my Mandarin is my my weakest uh, like language that I I'm determined to learn. I, I think also if you try to speak anything, people are like, "Wow, that's so cool! You you can say you can say like three words," mm -hmm. um, which 
you, you kind of feel like, okay, they're not really expecting too much of me, and I'm not actually a very high, I'm not a very high level in this language either. Okay, I'll just wing it. Um, so it does, it's kind of like the reverse as well. Um, it's just really interesting. Yeah, to get started, sure. it does get better. Yeah, and then it, uh, more pressure from there. <laughs> yes. So what's really important is to kind of think, yeah, to be kinder to yourself, but also to be critical because um, you know, fossilization and bad habits do happen um, with foreign languages. And the only way to get out of them is to really work on these these issues and, and um, to be critical, but also be kind at the same time. Yeah, I had a student who would um, be on their phone when they're listening to like uh, lectures for their for their language, and mm. on YouTube. And then they were wondering why they're not like learning anything. I'm like, mm, I don't know. Yeah, it is because their working memory can only deal with one thing at a time. Multitasking mm -hmm. doesn't really exist. Well, there's multitasking when it's something physical and when it's something you use your brain for. So you can listen, you can do sit-ups while you listen to a podcast, unless you're counting how many sit-ups you've done. As soon as you bring two parts of, two parts of like mental activity, your brain actually has to switch between them. So um, if I am trying to do like mark some work and I suddenly switch to Twitter, like what I'm doing all the time at the moment, I, I just lose where I am. Um, or if I'm trying to listen to something and I, I check my phone or um, talk to someone, you've, you've lost it. So... Yes, you've got to be very focused when you do these things. And I think that's the big problem with my listening right now is that I don't do any intensive listening. I just extensively listen and zone out and check, check Twitter and make dinner or something. Um, I need to fix that. That's cool, though. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll get the hang of it, especially since it's very close to Japanese. Um, I know that yes. helps me in the other way around, Korean being so... Hmm close to Japanese just makes so many things so much easier. Yeah, they are a really a complementary pair of languages because not just the grammar. The grammar is, oh, well, I mean, people say it's identical, some it's very close. I think it's, I'd say it's very close, but Korean is slightly mm -hmm. more complex in terms of the amount. Um, but also the words as well. They, the um, Hanja words, okay. they entered Korea and Japan. I think they entered Korea a little bit earlier, I'm not entirely sure. But they, they entered and it was almost the same Chinese language at the time, so they sound very, very similar. Yeah. But on the other flip side, there's still times where I see a tweet in Korean and I don't know a single word. I'm like, okay then. Mm. Yeah. Oh, what? Just like pass it with each, each word at a time. Yeah. All right. Well, um, is there anything else you'd like to touch upon or a topic that you were talking about and wanted to get back to or anything else you'd uh, like to discuss? Not right now. I feel like if I pick something completely different, we could be here for hours. So <laughs> I think it's a good moment to kind of wrap it all up. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll always keep tweeting stuff and whatever. Um, if I say anything interesting, just let me know. It just comes out as kind of like an um, incessant stream of consciousness. It's really cool um, with Twitter, just seeing all these different people making connections that you've never made before. And it's like, oh, mm. I spoke in that language my whole life. I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much for coming on and talking. It was great. You know, just going back and forth and kind of listening to your story and making that connection as well towards the end was really fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just how things go full circle. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah.